Hi, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the co-founders of Cloud Brewery and Cloud A. We're a consultancy in Canada that helps organizations learn how to adopt and use cloud technology in a very effective way. I thought it'd be a good idea to very briefly talk about what DevOps is not before I delve into exactly what DevOps is. So we all know what a developer does and we all know what operations are. DevOps is not the unholy union of developers and their equipment. It's also not a product. This change is very disruptive. So it's very challenging for some of the VARs that are in the market today. They want to productize everything and put their logo on it and sell it to you. So, you know, I would caution anybody out there that is trying to be sold DevOps has wrapped up the bow on it. In my opinion, it can't be done. It's also not a myth. There are a number of organizations today that are getting a lot of business benefit from DevOps. Here are some examples. Why does it matter? There are some very real business benefits to achieving a DevOps culture. Time to market is critical. Fewer bugs, lower cost to deliver, and no more vendor lock-in. In a pre-DevOps world, things were very different. This is an actual diagram of what a process looks like for a mature ITIL organization. You know, it's if it's not obvious, it's siloed and expensive and slow, and it, it inherently creates trust issues. So a lot of organizations are really struggling with this. And as a result, there are some progressive organizations that have developed some new ideas around how an IT organization can more effectively deliver business value. So you have developers, operations, and they work together. So the key component here is the quality assurance, the pink circle here. So where you really get the business value comes from ensuring the quality of that process. There are really three main phases of DevOps competency. The foundation is agile methods and automated testing. So a big component of Agile, you really must be automating your testing to be able to deliver a sprint in two or three weeks. This involves writing tests within your code so that you can change your code and know whether or not the test fails or not. If you're not familiar with this idea, it's quite deep. There are many ways to write ineffective tests for code, but you only really get the value if you're writing effective tests for your code. And then you have ideas like code coverage. So if you've got 10% code coverage, well, that's better than none, but you're probably not going to be catching the amount of errors that you'd like to, to be able to have confidence that you'd be able to deliver in a timely way with quality. So you want to get your code coverage up to something more like 80 or 90%. One of the biggest challenges we've seen with automated testing is really coaching the developers to understand the value of why they need to test their code and test it effectively and to give them the tools they need to do that job well. The next phase would be continuous integration. Once you have effective code coverage for testing, you can begin to automate the process of that testing. The icon here is uh, for a project called Jenkins. It's a very popular tool that's used to do continuous integration. So you can have a server in the background or a number of servers that are testing that code, running it through every iteration possible to find out whether or not it can create any bugs in an automated way. And at the end of that process, Jenkins will give you a report and tell you what your code coverage is, where there might be some issues, where it's failing, etc. Pretty effective. Next, we have continuous delivery. I'm going to go into this one in a little bit more detail, as this is where you get the real business value. This is, this is the start right here, where you start, you plan your sprint, and then you write code. Um, a lot of organizations these days will be familiar with Git. It's a very popular code management tool. Um, helps you merge and fork your code so that you can your developer team can be more effective. After you've written your code, or while you're reading your code, you can build and test. Ideally, you're doing that in automated ways with tools like Jenkins. The release cycle is a really important one. There's new technologies that are in the market. Puppet and Chef are the most popular ones, and they help you automate the process of delivering that code to a cloud environment or server. The most popular cloud environment these days is Amazon. There are a number of different ones. And then you wanna be able to monitor everything, not only from a technical perspective, but you wanna make sure that you're, you're monitoring the business 
outcomes of the software that you've been deploying. New Relic is just an example of one of the monitoring capabilities you can have to monitor performance. And then you're back at the planning stage. So it's likely through this process, you've already got several items on your backlog to start your new sprint. Typically during the testing phase and in the monitoring phase, you get feedback from your users that you would then use to iterate and plan your next sprint. We're gonna focus in on this area of the life cycle for a minute as it has the most business value and probably a lot of the most change that you're seeing in the market today. So where we have code automation technologies like Puppet, we're also seeing adoption of tools like Docker. So these work in conjunction with one another to essentially make your code more portable. And when you have portable code, the idea of multi-cloud comes into effect. If you've gotten to the point where you've automated everything up into the point where you're delivering your code to your cloud, well, at that point, you could use any cloud. So stop for a minute and think about what that means. If you've got code that you can deploy within minutes, how will that impact your disaster recovery plan? Isn't that the point of disaster recovery so that you could be able to change to a secondary provider in a minimal amount of time if you really had to? You know, if you're doing this well enough and you do it for long enough, you become comfortable with the idea that, you know, as long as my repositories are available for my code and I might want to make those redundant, multi-cloud becomes a really interesting option. So you have large organizations out there like GE, for example, saying our infrastructure will be 100% cloud-based at some point in the future. And they've made the commitment that it's not going to be to a certain cloud provider. They want to have this ability to be able to leverage different cloud providers for different purposes in a flexible way. So let's compare. Automated delivery of code that's containerized to multiple cloud environments to a pre-DevOps world. Just imagine what it would be like in a traditional IT environment to be able to take the code from an environment and move it. Typically that would take months if not years for lots of organizations. Just imagine if you could do it in minutes. I thought it would be a good idea just to look at the process in a more linear way. This is the same process, it's just from beginning to end. Plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, operate. Um, it gives you a little bit of a different view where you can see you do get this collaborative benefit based on the competency that you have in the different areas of DevOps culture. So if you've, you've got Agile down, great. You're probably getting some collaborative benefit from that. Once you've got continuous integration working for you and delivery, you're going to get more. Understanding that the business benefits of DevOps isn't hard, but I think understanding how to achieve that value is really a, a bit of a struggle for some organizations. So I thought... To wrap this up, I would just briefly talk about some of the reasons why we've seen DevOps fail within organizations. If you don't have trust, you're probably not going to be ready for DevOps. If fundamentally, if the people within your organization don't get along with each other and trust each other to some degree that's reasonable, then I wouldn't even suggest trying to adopt some of these ideas. Because we're not talking about superficial change. Probably the biggest challenge we've seen is a lot of organizations are so familiar with projects that they see the introduction of DevOps as a project and not as a cultural shift. The key to success is realizing this will take a lot of time. Cultural change is not something that's easy for any organization. Well, that wraps it up. Um, we've been doing consulting in this space for the last several years. Uh, before that, we've built public and private clouds in Canada. If there's anything we can help you with, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thanks very much.